a, a composite version of Wilson's theorem. You guys remember a composite number is just any number that's not a prime number. It has at least one divisor other than itself and one. So let's take a look at why uh, n equals 4 does not work here. Uh, and it's pretty easy to see. Uh, if you take n equals 4, you would get 3 factorial, uh, which is 6. And I'm just going to tersely write this down. That 3 factorial is not congruent. We'll just use the negated congruence relation right here. Put the slash through there. I think it goes in that direction. Is not congruent to 0 uh, mod 4, right? 4 is the, uh, I guess, the s smallest composite number. Okay, mod 4. There we go. And again, that's just simply because 4 does not divide 6. 3 factorial is 6, right? 1 times 2 times 3 is 6. So 4 does not divide uh, 6, and that's the formulation. There's three formulations here of congruence. Just this triple bar notation where it's understood to be modulo n. And then that's equivalent to saying that n just divides n minus 1 factorial. But you see in the case right up here, uh, 6 certainly does not, uh, I mean, 4 does not divide 6. 4 is not a divisor of 6. But we're going to show that for every other composite number that, that this, this, this is true. And it looks a lot like this Wilson's theorem where we take, uh, that's for all P up here, for all prime P. Famous result, a little bit harder to prove, uh, but it's, it's a well-known result from number theory. Now let's go ahead and, and jump on into this and let's take advantage of what the definition of composite means. Uh, because uh, we're assuming that N is composite, you're going to have uh, at least one divisor. We don't know if I and J are distinct here, but you're going to at least have one divisor that's strictly between 1 and N, okay? So, for, for example, uh, 24. You can write 24 as 3 times 8, right? So that's an example of the I and J that would exist. Now, when you first look at this problem, you just think, oh, it's super easy because it's obvious, but you have to also consider the case of when I and J are equal. Now, this very first case is pretty easy. Uh, just straightforward, I and J exist somewhere between 1 and N minus 1, and so we can see pretty quickly that N minus 1 factorial, get this here, uh, N minus 1 factorial is equal to, um, Is equal to some k, and I'll go ahead and write this down. Just we could be really formal about it, but we know that it's it's some k times i times j, right? But that's equal to kn. So you see, this is a more convenient way to write the congruence just directly is the product of the two divisors, in my opinion. So you see case one's trivial, right? We've, we can check off on this. We can put a, a box here, whatever you want for case one. And again, y'all, the K that you would get would be all the other factors in this expansion of N minus one factorial other than I and J. You know, like K would be composed of one, two, three, uh, N minus two, N minus one, right? So we've proved it very easily for case one. And that's the first case you think of when you see this and you don't think this is even worthy of a theorem. Now, the second case is when I is actually equal to J. Okay, when I is actually equal to J. And that would mean that we could write N as J squared or I squared. So in other words, this is the same thing as saying uh, N is equal to um, J squared or I squared. I'm just using J because it's easier for me to make a J than an I. My eyes don't always look that discernible. So we have uh, n is equal to uh, j squared, right? Okay, but that means right here that this would be j squared minus 1 at the tail end here, right? j squared minus 1 right here. Okay, and then we're guaranteed to have the appearance 
of a of a two factors of J. This J is obvious, right? Clear, clearly, the J exists in the n minus one uh, factorial expansion. Now, this one here may be obvious to some, but it wasn't to me really. I, I didn't really stop and think about multiples of J. J squared is a multiple of J, but there are, are smaller multiples of J than J squared. Now, uh, notice right here what makes it click. If you don't see this, this is just J squared. Minus J, right? All right, this part right here, but that's clearly comes up, right? Because J squared minus J is less than J squared minus one, right? So that's kind of nice just to see it formally. This is more of a notational thing. It's pretty easy to see for case one. You just go, sure, sure, I believe this, right? But it's the the part here is a little little tricky in my opinion to notationally apprehend this. And so you see, we get the very same thing. We get the very same thing. We have a copy of J here and we have a copy of J here. Everything else would comprise the K that you see right here. You see you have K times J squared because J and J right here. And so we're done again. And that's the end of the proof, folks. Uh, I liked it a little bit just because it's one of those proofs that seems very believable, but one of the cases is a little difficult, at least for me, to come up with notationally. Thank you for viewing.